Welcome to all of the witnesses. Um, can I ask first if the witnesses who are here have been following the previous meetings of the Public Accounts Committee, where we had the Commissioner in and some of the civilian heads. Have people been briefed on what has gone before? Has anybody been briefed by their superiors or brief, given briefing notes? Just for, for myself, I haven't been briefed at all. Right. I haven't followed the, the, the committee, though I have, just to be clear, I've seen numerous things on uh, television and news bulletins and uh, But no Vincent formal Brown briefing. And, Has anybody been no. formally briefed by their superiors? No. Okay. But people will be aware of, members of Angarish Shea Kona here, I'm sure, are aware of previous hearings and what's gone before, I'm assuming. Yes, I can say that I've uh, seen some of the hearings. I haven't seen them all. Okay. Okay, I start with you, Mr. Dunn. Um, you may not be aware because it may not have been what you picked up in the media coverage that you cite, but uh, at the last meeting of this committee where we discussed this issue, the Head of Internal Audit, Mr. Niall Kelly, in his opening statement, states that there was instances of interference non-cooperation and withholding information from internal audit. Are you aware of his claim in that regard? No. Okay. He talks about a time period from 2008 to 2011. He cites the Executive Director of Finance as being one of those who did not cooperate, withheld information from him. That was Mr. Colhan. Uh, he cites the Chief Superintendent uh, at the Training College at the time, the Administrator, and the Chief Administrative Officer. So who would have been the Chief Administrative Officer from 2008 to 2011? I, I'm not specifically sure. Uh, it certainly wasn't me. Uh, I think for part of that, Mr. Leamy might have been, but I'm not sure when he started and when he finished. Okay, but, but certainly, it certainly it was, finished before. Okay. Uh, it was the office, the, the office of the CAO in any event that he claims uh, either withheld information from him, interfered with his work, or did not cooperate with his uh, work. Okay. Who was the Chief Superintendent at the Training College at the time, from 2008 to 2011? Was that you, Mr McCabe? No, I'm super, Superintendent. Super, uh, who was the Chief Superintendent? Chief Superintendent, uh, 2008 would have been Chief Superintendent McGann, 2009 to 2010 would have been Chief Superintendent, recently retired Assistant Commissioner Nolan. And who would have had uh, responsibility for day-to-day -day management of the Garda Training College from 2008 up to 2016? Specifically within that structure, who has operational command and... and well, the Chief Superintendent would be in overall uh, all charge and superintendents would have responsibility for various functions. With so you would have some obvious, obvious responsibility. Perhaps, and, yes. uh, um, is it Assistant Commissioner McMahon, is it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, between, you had as well? Between August 11, sorry, between March 11 and August 16, I had responsibility for the Garda College. Um, between August, uh, sorry, between March 11 and uh, August 15, it was uh, an additional responsibility I held. I was the Chief Superintendent in charge of the Garda Community Relations Bureau at Harcourt Square. So I was there, um, it was an additional responsibility for that time, and I was there on a full-time basis from August 15 to August 16. So if I can put it to uh, Ms McMahon, Mr McCabe and Mr Dunn, uh, would you uh, be of the view that none of you either withheld information or did not cooperate with or frustrated the work of um, Mr Kelly and internal audit? Would that be your view? Well, Starting with you, Mr. Myself, Dunn? No, yeah. absolutely not. That would be your view. And Mr McCabe? Absolutely not. And Mr McMahon? Likewise. Okay. Uh, Mr Kelly says that he sought a copy of the McGee report in 2008. Uh, Mr McGee, that was your report. He sought a copy of that report and never got it. Who would have had responsibility uh, to make sure that he would have got that report? Mr Dunn. I understand that that happened before my time. And I understand everybody so has a view I, that it happened before their time. What I'm interested well, in is process, Mr Dunn, please. I want, okay. So we, if you we, could tell me when I could give in you... In 2008. Uh, 2008. I was nowhere near on Garda Sheikh Yeah. Uh, so 
what went on at that point in time and who was responsible for what. But you I would understand. Possibly, no, I can't no, possibly. No, no, sorry, sorry to Mr. Dunn. Like that. No, sorry, Mr. So, you, you, you can't because what I'm asking is in terms of process, if internal auditors seeks a copy of a report from the finance director that was carried out by Mr. McGee and he says that he never got that report, uh, I want to know today who was responsible for giving him that report. He, when we had uh, Mr. Colhan here, Mr. Colhan says that it was the CEO at the time who would have had to make that call. So I'm trying, we're trying to establish a call was made. Mr. Kelly is saying he was frustrated in his work. He was trying to get a copy of Mr. McGee's report. He never got it. He, he, he wrote to Mr. Colhan several times. He wrote to the CEO, never got it. So who in the organisation would have had responsibility to give internal audit the 2008 report? I have no knowledge of what was going on at that point. Does in anybody time, in the so room have any knowledge of who? I can't possibly speculate. Well, you can who? with respect, but is that, does well, anybody in the room know well, well, who I should have had responsibility? Speculate. Sorry? I won't speculate. I'll give you information that I have, but I won't speculate. Yeah, and I'm not asking you to speculate with respect, Mr. Dunn. The witnesses in, in this room today I worked for or still work for Angarda Siakana. I'm asking about process. I'm asking about who's responsible for what. If people who formerly worked in very senior positions in Angarda Siakana cannot answer questions about who is responsible for what, that concerns me. So if you can't answer, Mr. Dunn, maybe somebody else. Mr. Well, Mr. O'Quaylon, can you answer, history, please? Um, the uh, internal auditor, Mr. Kelly, he reports to me. Uh, that's the reporting line. And any issues that Mr. Kelly has in relation to um, provision of documentation in relation to any of his work, uh, or any difficulties that he might, that he might uh, have in obtaining uh, that information, I've made it quite clear to him that he is to let me know of any difficulties he would have so that I could okay, ensure... Okay, we're talking here with respect to yeah. 2008. Yes. He sought a copy of the report. You have heard his testimony in the past. He did not get that. Yes. He got a summary of a 2010 report in 2011, but the 2008 Mr McGee's report, he saw it several times, never got it. It's a very straightforward, simple question yes. I'm asking. Who had responsibility mm -hmm. when he sought the report to make sure that Mr McGee got the report? Whoever Mr Kelly asked should have given him the report. So Mr Colhan? Whoever he asked should have given him the report. So you're yes. saying that Mr Colhan had responsibility? Mr Kelly has, uh, as an internal auditor, can seek and, and is entitled to get any information he, he needs to pursue his work. And you might be able to stick with me here then, Mr um, O'Quaylon. Um, O'Quaylon. O'Quaylon, sorry. He said uh, also in 2008 that the Secretary General, this is Mr Colhan, that the Secretary General of the Department of Justice and the CNAG should be informed about the 2008 report. We now know that the Secretary General of the Department was not informed at that time, and we also know that the CNAG's office was not informed at the time. So when Mr. Colhan said that the Secretary General of the Department should have been informed and the CNAG should have been informed, and he says he would have informed his superiors of that, whose responsibility was it to ensure that the CNAG's office was informed? Well, again, um, we have an audit committee on which uh, someone of my rank always sits. Uh, that has been the, the, since the uh, committee was established in, in 2006, I, I, I believe. So uh, if Mr Kelly was uh, making such recommendations, uh, they would have passed through the... Uh, Sorry, Ms. Mr Coulon, yeah. it wasn't Mr Kelly who, who stated that it should happen. It's the head of the finance director, which at the time was Mr Colhan. Mr Colhan put it in writing yeah. uh, to his superior that the department should be made aware and the CNAG's office should be made aware, right. and it didn't happen. So I'm asking who would have been responsible for making sure that the CNAG's office was informed? Well, Mr Colhan would have uh, written to his line manager, who at that time would have been the Chief Administrative Officer. The Chief Administrative yes. Officer. Would that be your understanding, Mr Dunn, that it would have been the Chief Administration Officer's responsibility to inform the CNAG if Mr Colhan, as he did, had wrote to the C CAO at the time? I don't know what Mr Colhan wrote to the CAO. If Mr Colhan wrote to the CAO recommending that he do something, then I would expect that it's the CAO's decision as to what he does. It's, it's, it's not for the, the line manager in any circumstance you know, to take an instruction from a subordinate. So, you know, 
So I, I can't see that it's anybody else's responsibility, uh, given a recommendation, and I'm assuming that's what Did you read the internal audit report, Mr Dunn? No, I didn't. You didn't read it? No, I didn't. That's incredible. You have uh, not I, read Mr Kelly's internal audit uh, report? Mr Kelly only supplied me with two pages. Did you ask he, for a copy of that report in advance of this meeting? No, I didn't. So you're here because, to field questions on a report which you haven't... You're answering questions in, in respect of your own role and the role of your predecessors in terms of the office, and you haven't even read the report which I, we're discussing. I wasn't asked to come here to account for the role of my predecessors. But you're certainly accountable for yourself and, and the office that you held. Correct. Yes. Absolutely. And you haven't read the report, because we're going to get to your role in a few minutes, and you haven't read the interim audit report. No. And you, haven't, you didn't ask for a copy of it before I got, this meeting? I, I got from Mr Kelly two pages. Uh, Mr Kelly said to me, or wrote to me actually, that these were the only two pages that had reference to me. So that's... Well, I, I find that unacceptable, Cahirlock, but anyway, that's... Well, uh, well I think it, it, it may be unacceptable, but it is true. I'm not saying uh, it's not, so, I'm not, so saying it's not true, Kelly, and if I can just say to you, Mr so, Dunn, I am putting questions to you fairly, and when I put questions fairly, I expect fair responses. So all I'm saying to you is that I believe it is reasonable for a witness coming before the Public Accounts Committee to have at least read a report, which is the substance of what we are discussing here today. And if you have not read the report, I think it's reasonable for me to be concerned about that, and I've stated that for the record. You can have your own view. That's your own entitlement. I've given you my view, and I think it's unacceptable. Uh, Mr McCarthy, um, can you help me out here in relation to I, who I should have informed? Can I, I of course, respond yeah. to that? So what I was referring to was a letter, sorry, an email actually, from Niall Kelly to me, okay, dated the 27th of September 2016. <clears throat> in regard to providing you with more than the extracts provided, those two pages, I am not sure whether you are requesting a full copy of the report. Other than the extracts provided, there are no other sections of the report relevant to yourself. Perhaps we could also dis discuss this at our meeting. So, very clearly, Deputy, I have been informed that there are two extracts that are relevant to me. I have come to this committee to help the committee and to account. But to be expected then that I account for something which uh, in an internal audit report, which the internal auditor has said uh, does not refer to me, I think is not, not reasonable. And I'm not so asking you to do that. that. I'm, what, what, what I'm saying position. is that you should have, in my view, should have read the report, but we can disagree on that. That, that, that was the 27th of <laughs> September 2016. Uh, I subsequently then got a, uh, a letter uh, from, or sorry, an email. Uh, so a letter, actually, uh, da, 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 da. in response to our telephone conversation on 30th of September. Sorry, this is dated uh, the February 2017. Uh, in response to our telephone conversation and other correspondence related to the Garda College Audit Report and taking on board the points raised by you, I have made the attached changes to the section of the report that concerns your actions in relation to the to the issues. So again, referring to two paragraphs, basically, in the report. Thank you. So Thank that's you. the basic. Um, be helpful. We're not in possession of the document you're reading from. Okay. So if you have a moment, we'll ask somebody to that's take a photocopy so it can yeah. be circulated. We have yeah. had sight of that. So essentially, I'm just trying to understand the sequence. There was a draft report produced. You were asked for your comments in respect of the aspects that you were relevant to yourself Correct. before the report was finalised. Correct. I just want to understand. Correct. But Maybe somebody can take, a, take the correspondence and we'll take photocopies. Absolutely. Is that in order? Absolutely. We haven't seen that. So. Absolutely. Thank you. And, we'll and if I can just come to Mr. McCarthy. So we're at the stage in 2008 where Mr. Colhan has notified his superior that the Secretary General of the Department of Justice should be informed and the Juror Office should be informed. You would have heard his testimony in the past. We now know that did not happen. You've heard from Mr Dunn as well. I'm trying to establish what the process should have been. Who, sh who was responsible for actioning that call for Mr Colhan to make sure your office would have been informed? What would your understanding be? What would you have expected? Well, my understanding is that that recommendation uh, was submitted up the line in Ungarda Siakana and that it went to the Commissioner yeah. and that the Commissioner agreed to uh, my office being informed. I can't remember if he, he agreed to the Secretary-General being informed. 
but um, as I said, it, it didn't happen thereafter. So this was a letter that was sent from the CAO to the Commissioner, and the Commissioner uh, uh, at the time knew of the issues. He notes the areas of concern in the former CEO's letter and then says the CNAG should be informed. Yes. Uh, so who then would have had responsibility for informing your office at that point? Well, it's not clear to me who would have had responsibility, but a direction of the Commissioner, I would assume, it could have been by a number, any of a number of persons. Okay, does that, can, any, can any of the, can, Mr. Coulon, can you maybe enlighten us? Direction from the Commissioner. Um, I know it, it was uh, Commissioner Murphy directed that certain things be done at, a, uh, at that time. I'm not sure of the exact date of it now, but uh, Mr. Murphy did, Commissioner Murphy at the time. Uh, so he would have directed that back out to one of the deputy commissioners or the CAO to have that matter uh, looked after. So who would, who would have had a responsibility for informing the CNHG's office specifically? A direction was given by, from the commissioner to the CEO. Is, is that what you're telling me? He would have, he, he, it would have, that would have been the chain of command if that happened. It, it, it could have gone to a, either the CAO and I, or I would say maybe the deputy, deputy commissioner uh, strategy and change management at the time. Either of those. So the Deputy Commissioner of Change Management the one that, that possibly the, the was, I currently, was uh, the office that would have been informed. Yes. We've made a decision to inform the CNAG yes. this needs to be done. Because that Deputy Commissioner would have sat on the um, Internal Audit Committee. And, and was it done? Obviously not. Yeah. yeah. Why, why, in your view, was it I, not I've done? No, I have no idea. I can't answer that question. Yeah. And, and is, that's a pattern that seems to emerge. Nobody seems to know why all of these things, these things had not happened. But we'll get to that on another date. But in terms of process, what you're telling me is that the Commissioner makes a decision, the uh, um, Executive Director of Change Management uh, would have had a res possibly responsibility, or the CEO, you're not quite sure. The Deputy Commissioner uh, uh, on my side of the House, which is the Strategy and Change Management, as it was called then, uh, would have been sitting on the Internal Audit Committee. And, okay. uh, I would but say it didn't that happen. Well, it's clear that it didn't, clear it didn't happen. And then we move on to 2011, and we know that uh, when Mr. Kelly was here previously, Mr. Coulon, he says that he got a summary of a report, the 2010 report, uh, which is Mr. Nolan's report, I understand, in 2011. He did not get the full report. In any event, he received a letter uh, from the CEO at the time with a, f uh, a footnote, uh, a handwritten note from the Commissioner. And he was given certain assurances that changes would be made, recommendations would be implemented, and he removed a vital paragraph from that, his 2011 report. And you're aware of, of that? Yes, he has yeah. that in his, the interim audit report. Uh, and outlines that. you're aware that at this committee he regrets the fact that he removed that paragraph now? That's, that's what he yeah. stated. Yeah. Are you also aware that he also said he felt duped? I that, that paragraph, that he, he, he took assurances at face value and he felt duped. Are you, are you aware of I'm, that? I'm aware of that being stated, yes. And would you, given what you now know, would you agree that he was duped? Um, it's a matter of an interpretation from Mr. Ke from Mr. Kelly. Uh, I can't get into the mindset of the people who were then in office and who were making those decisions. Uh, what is clear to me, having uh, studied uh, the historical aspect of, of, of what has developed, is that there was lots of work and lots of reports being carried out um, and that there were certain interpretations being taken of... Would you agree that in any organisation, especially in Angarda Síochána, you would not expect the head of internal audit to at any time feel duped? That that would be, for me, a red line issue, that internal audit should not at any time feel duped. They should get absolute full cooperation. So would you accept at least that if that was the view of the head of internal audit, that that's a problem? I would, I would have, absolutely. Yes. And then the assurances that were given then in 2011 with that footnote from the Commissioner, and we now know that those uh, recommendations were not implemented, who in the organisation would have had responsibility for implementing the recommendations? Well, again, it would depend on what type of recommendation it was. And but you read the report? Who, yes. So you've, mis, with respect would, to Mr. Cook, yeah. you've read the report. You understand the issues intimately. You know exactly what letter I'm talking about. This was uh, sent to, uh, to Mr. Uh, um, Kelly from the CEO uh, with a footnote from the Commissioner. So I know you're intimately aware of, of the letter mm. and the report and recommendations were made because we discussed this with the Commissioner. The Commissioner wasn't able to tell us why the recommendations were not implemented. Further examination has been done. Yes. I'm not asking about 
why they were not. I'm asking who was responsible. I would say that it was the Deputy Commissioner of Strategy and Change Management. That was the side of the House that would have been uh, given that. Uh, and would, it, would it have been only the Deputy Commissioner of Change Management, or would it have been other people in the organisation? Well, if you look at, the, at that level of the organisation, all of the other functions fall out of each Deputy Commissioner has responsibility for a number of issues, as has the CAO. Uh, so, uh, on the operational front, which is headed by Deputy Commissioner Toomey at the moment, that's purely operational, and there's operational issues go in there to be, to be dealt with. And uh, Mr. McCabe and Ms. McMahon, um, I would imagine that people who are responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the Garda Training College would, would have had a role in relation to implementing the recommendations. No. Just one last, one last one question. Last. Yeah. Yeah. Just to clarify, uh, I was there, I was in the college at the time, but I had no, I, didn't, I did not see that report and I had no uh, involvement in it. So you never even saw the report? No. And you were in the training college at the time? Absolutely. And what was your position? I was, uh, uh, I had responsibility for crime investigation training and administration. Okay, and just on 2015, Mr Dunn, we got a, a note, and I've given it to the Secretariat, which came from a, a note of a meeting of the second meeting of the steering group, I think it was, um, and it came from the head of legal, Mr Rowan. It was a note that he would have done. And it says on the 6th of July 2015, the Executive Director of Human Resources, Mr Barrett, delivered a report to C the CEO, um, and that... Uh, that report was to be given to the, the Audit Committee in July um, of that year. Uh, that report, why was that report commissioned? I, sorry, excuse me. I asked Mr Barrett to prepare a summary of the issues as he knew them at that point in time for me. Yeah, uh, for what so, purpose? So that I could understand what the, what the, the, the issues were. And this also, also, yeah. uh, I considered at that point whether it was appropriate at that point uh, to uh, bring the audit committee into play, as I would describe it. I decided that it wasn't at that point, that was July, uh, but that it was more appropriate to wait until the September meeting. The reason for that was because, <coughs> as I read that report, it was actually clear to me that there was an awful lot of information that was missing. Uh, secondly, that I would not have been in a position to answer even the, uh, the simplest question about the report, and there were no corroborating uh, evidence at that point in time. What, what we know, so, what we know so, from the internal audit reports that you haven't read, Mr Dunn, mm -hmm. is that internal audit is quite critical of you in that regard. And Mr Barrett, when he was here, was also quite critical, yeah. because his view is that you should have informed the Audit Committee in July. Uh, you did brief the audit committee in the September meeting under any other business. A copy of the report wasn't circulated to members in advance. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr Coulomb, when you were here before, I asked you about that, and you said that it was your understanding that a comprehensive briefing was given to uh, the September uh, internal audit committee uh, meeting, that that was your view of the minutes. You weren't yeah. at the meeting, but that was your view. Mr Howard, who subsequently was before the committee, and I'll quote directly from him, says this. There was a very busy agenda that day, and at the end of the meeting, this was raised verbally as an AOB item. There was no briefing given to us. I have reflected on how I will phrase this. Neither, neither I nor any of the other outside members of the committee took from that briefing any sense of the importance of this issue as it subsequently emerged. Ultimately, this issue was so serious that the accounting officer had to amend the statement of internal financial control. I do not believe that has happened before on the Garda vote. So, objectively speaking, this was a very serious issue. It was raised, we discussed it a bit, and we were asked if we would include it in the 2016 programme of work which was done. That was Mr Kelly's report at this time. But no indication was given to us that this was different. And he then went on to say that he got no understanding at all of the seriousness of the issues. Uh, so, that doesn't really chime, Mr O'Coulon, with uh, your reading of the minutes, does it, Mr Howard's? statement to, to this committee? Well, all I can say, I wasn't at that meeting. Yes. I, 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 in my preparation to take up my position in that committee, I w would have read over all these So minutes. you weren't at the meeting? I would have spoken okay. to okay. But Mr. you've now Dunn. heard from Mr Howard, who was at the meeting, and he's yes. the chair of the committee. Yes. And that's his view. So you've heard his view. Well, from my reading of the minutes... Yeah. I'll come to you in a second, Mr you. Dunn, please. Yeah. Yeah. I still, having looked at those minutes, having sat on that committee for the past 12 months or over, um, I feel that uh, 
from the, from the, the detailed notes in those minutes, it would appear to me that there was a very comprehensive briefing given by Mr. Dunn on that day, uh, because that is what is reflected in the minutes, and that is what is agreed in the following, at the following meeting. So that's my interpretation of what and I said. Before saw. I come to you on that, just one last question for you, Mr. Dunn, because it, 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 it very much mirrors what happened with the internal uh, audit committee briefing or not. Because in this note that's up on the screen, um, when you go down further, it's an account of uh, what you said, and it says that you, the CEO, you said, the CEO wished to make it very clear that there is no basis to suggest any misappropriation or mishandling, fraud or otherwise, or any suggestion of inappropriate activity. Now, you're saying at the steering group that you could not see, if this is correct, if the notes are correct, you could not see any suggestion of inappropriate activity. Yet the Garda Commissioner, when she was here, accepts the findings in the report. The Garda Commissioner accepts that there was financial irregularities. Here we have the second meeting of the steering group, and we have the CAO stating at that meeting, if this is correct, that you saw no basis for, to suggest any misappropriation or mishandling fraud, even though Mr Kelly says he could not give those assurances. He had to keep an open mind. But then to go further and say no suggestion of even inappropriate activity, um, I find staggering. So can you explain to this committee how you felt at that time, given what you knew, that you could not see any inappropriate activity? Mr Dunn, you have concluded, and going straight to Deputy Murphy and Deputy Colonel Nan can come back again at a later time. Thank you. So going back to the, 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 the first point that you were talking about, which is the, uh, the uh, meeting uh, of the Audit Committee and whether there was an appropriate briefing given to that Audit Committee, I actually have a minute, uh, which I can read to you. So the CAO has been, so Mr. Cyril Dunn raised an issue in relation to the administration at the Garda College and numerous bank accounts set up in its name. The CAO has been charged with putting an internal working group together to look at issues of administration in the Garda College. Some previous actions identified haven't yet been completed. All sections will be involved, strategy and change management, finance, etc. A representative from the Department of Justice and Equality has been invited to ensure visibility. The Attorney General's office has been consulted in relation to possible legal issues. Issues could potentially go back as far as the 1960s to the foundation of the college. It is important to ensure that any, ensure that any accounting issues get regularised in this financial year. This will also put a demand on the resources of group internal audit and needs to be factored into the 2016 audit plan. There was a general discussion among the committee members and the following matters were raised. Is the Garda College a legal entity? What is the legal status of the college restaurant? Is the Garda College a limited company? The Commissioner's right to own property. The CAO stressed the importance that any legal issues need to be clarified and that GAS can conduct an audit or review. The following areas need to be examined. Accounts, land owned by OPW, title of the land, leases, employee contracts where legal advice is needed and the sports field company. The question was, does it come under the direction stroke control of the Garda College? It was agreed that this is a very complex matter and there are sensitivities surrounding this issue. Reputation is important and time frames, security of employment are very sensitive areas. The committee noted the demands that are likely to be placed on internal audit during 2016 and asked to be kept informed of developments in this matter. That is the minute. We're gone five minutes over the time. Uh, Mr. John, have we got that document again? Or? You do. Pardon? We have that document. Thanks. And Deputy Morgan, you come back because you're way over time.